Okay. Ja, lieber Arnold, du hast uns jetzt drei deiner Erfolgsregeln schon einmal mitgeteilt. Aber ähm, ich weiß aus verschiedensten Vorträgen, die ich von dir schon gesehen habe, dass es da noch ein paar wichtige gibt, nämlich wie wichtig ist dieser Plan B, wo viele sagen, man braucht einen Plan B, man braucht einen Plan B, ein Plan reicht nicht aus, du musst auch auf Nummer sicher gehen. Was sagst du dazu? Well, I hate Plan B. <lacht> And I tell you why. Because we have so many doubters, as I've said earlier, the, the no-sayers. We have so many of those people that say no and you can't do it, and it's impossible. That is okay because we just turn off, as I said earlier, and we listen and we hear the no being a yes, you can't do it, do it, you can do it, and all of that. So that, that is possible to do that amongst all the negative people around you. But when you start doubting yourself, that's very dangerous. Because now what you're basically saying is, is that if my plan doesn't work, I have a fallback plan, I have a plan B. And that means that you start thinking about plan B and every thought that you put into plan B, you're taking away now that thought and that energy from plan A. And, and it's very important to understand that we function better if there is no safety net, because plan B becomes a safety net. It says that if I fail, then I fall and I get picked up and I have something else there that was that will protect me. And that's not good, because people perform better when there's no safety net. People perform better in sports and everything else if you don't have a plan B. I'm telling you, I've never ever had a plan B. I say I made a full commitment that I'm gonna go and be a bodybuilding champion. I made a full commitment that I'm gonna be in America I made a full commitment that I'm going to get in the show business and I'm going to be a leading man no matter what it takes. I will do the work. I will do the work over and over and over until I get it. And the same was in politics and everything like that. So to me, it is very dangerous to have a plan B because you're cutting yourself off from the chance of really succeeding. And the reason, one of the main reasons why people want to have a plan B is because they are worried about failing. What is if I fail, then I don't have anything else? Well, let me tell you something. Don't be afraid of failing because there's nothing wrong with failing. You have to fail in order to climb that ladder. There's no one that doesn't fail. Michael Jordan said in one of his interviews, when they said, you're unbelievable, you're the greatest basketball player of all times. I mean, tell me about that. And he says, well, you just mentioned the successes. But he says, for me to become the greatest basketball player, I missed 9,000 shots when I was playing basketball at the NBA games. So during these games that he was so successful, he missed 9,000 shots. Does it make him a failure? No. He's one of the greatest basketball players of all times, but he failed 9,000 times. Do you get it? We all fail. It's okay. What is not okay is that when you fail, you stay down. Whoever stays down is a loser. And winners will fail and get up. Fail and get up. Fail and get up. You always get up. That is a winner. That is a winner. I failed in bodybuilding. I've, I've, I lost bodybuilding competitions. I lost powerlifting competitions. I lost weightlifting competitions. 
I had movies that went in the toilet and that were terrible and got the worst reviews. And in politics, I remember, I had many of the initiatives on the ballot and we lost. My approval rating in California went down to 28%, and then it went back up again, and they won again the governorship. Hey, we all lose. We all have lost us. This is okay, and this is why I say don't be worried about losing, because when you're afraid of losing, then you get frozen. You get stiff. You're not relaxed. You've got to be, in order to perform well in anything, if it's in boxing or if it is on your job or with your thinking, is only happening when you relax. So relax. It's okay to fail. Let's just go all out and give it everything that you got. That's what it is all about. So don't be afraid to fail. Um, my wife Kirsten and I, we, um, uh, we have a foundation and built up schools in Africa for poor children. So because I think it's very important when uh, you are successful to give, to give back to the society, give back to the world. What is your opinion to this? I absolutely agree and I think this is one of my six rules to success. You can only feel complete as a person if you think about what can you do for your fellow member around you that maybe needs help. I felt like that everyone has a different motivation why you get into that. I, I was an immigrant going to America and I saw how America was the most generous country in the world. I mean, they opened up their arms to me, they helped me, they invited me for Thanksgiving dinner, the people, they brought me, uh, the bodybuilders in the gym brought me plates to my apartment because I had no plates, I had no silverware, I had no bedware, I had no pillows, I had no blanket, I had no TV, I had no radio, I had nothing. They brought it to my apartment. They helped me. And I saw that firsthand, this generosity in America. And I said to myself, as an immigrant that is being embraced with open arms, that I need to go and make sure that I give something back. Right? Because I started, I started thinking about how did America become such a great country? How did America become such a generous country? Well, I look back in history and I realized that people have fought for America. And people have died for America. And people have suffered for America. And so it's my job now to contribute, to keep it as being the number one country in the world. And this is when I started feeling obligated and I said to myself, so what can I do? I'm a bodybuilder, what can I do? Well, then I realized when I saw Special Olympics that I can help and train Special Olympians. And so we started getting involved in Special Olympics and in no time I proposed to them to start powerlifting in Special Olympics to have deadlift, which was a safe thing to do, and to have bench press, which was a safe thing to do. And it became the number one sports in Special Olympics, powerlifting. They always have a packed hall of 5,000 people. And I became the national trainer and the international trainer of Special Olympics. And I tell you, I felt so good I felt better than winning a bodybuilding competition, going to one of their competitions and seeing a hundred of those athletes from all over the world competing in powerlifting and being happy and being included and being felt that they're equal to all of us. It was the most unbelievable feeling and this is why I got so excited about it that then after that, I started you know, going around to military bases in America and training our military personnel. Because in those days, bodybuilding and weight training wasn't popular. Now it is. Now when you go to Iraq, to Baghdad or somewhere like that, and you see the American soldiers train, they have the biggest facilities. It's like this, this dome here. This is how big the facility, the training facilities are now. So it all changed. But in those days, there was, it wasn't popular at all. So I went from military base to military base to train the soldiers. 
and the sailors and the airmen and all of them. And it made me feel good again. And then after when I met President Bush, then Vice President Bush, and we traveled around to campaign, he asked me what I want to do. And I said, I would like to be a fitness leader in America. I would like to be the chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. And then when he became president, he appointed me to that. And so now I really was able to travel through all 50 states and promote health and fitness. And the more I got into that, the more I realized how good it feels to give something back. And that's when my idea came about, about after school programs, because after school, when I traveled to all the schools to train the students, I saw there was a huge gathering of students after the school was over outside the school. And I asked the school principal, what are all the students doing? And he said to me, Arnold, you have to understand that 70% that the kids in our school, they come from parents where 70% of the parents are both working. So therefore, there's no one there picking them up. So that's got me the idea to start after school programs, to keep these kids in school while the parents are working and to offer them homework assistance, tutoring, and sports and fitness programs and arts programs, music and painting and so on. And it became a huge success. <laughs> So as you know, it becomes addictive. So it becomes addictive. So then when, of course, when they became very successful, and now we have after-school programs all over the United States. Then, of course, when uh, 2003 happened, where there was a governor's race in California, I said to myself, now is my chance to jump in there and to really give everything. And people said to me, says, are you crazy to run for governor? When you're governor, he says, you cannot go and make movies anymore. I said, well, duh. I mean, I know that, that you can't run the state and make movies. Of course not. He says, well, you would lose all these millions of dollars. I mean, you're getting 20, 25, 30 million dollars a movie. You will lose that. And I say, I don't care. I say, all the money that I made is because of America. My success is because of America. Everything that I've accomplished is because of America. I said, so for me now to give something back for seven years and not to make money, makes no difference to me. I say, I'm going to do it. And I jumped in the end of the race and did it. And let me tell you something. I'm not poor because those seven years I didn't get paid. I'm perfectly fine. And it made me feel good that I could give back to America. Arnold, I uh, have tell the people here today that uh, my opinion is it is very important to to learn lifetime. Don't stop in learning, go on, go forward. And what do you think about learning? What, what do you think about to have a coach? Is it important to have a coach? Is it important to have someone who can tell you, tell you what you are doing, who can help you? What is your opinion to this? Well, I think that every day we are benefiting from someone helping us. That's why I said earlier, there's no such thing as a self-made man. I mean, when you think about it, you're born and you need your parents to raise you. You need your teachers to teach you. You need your coaches to do sports. And so when I think about back of the people that helped me, as a matter of fact, one person, where's my friend here, Albert Busek? Is he sitting here somewhere? Where is he sitting? Albert Busek, come on out here for a second. Come on out here for a second. The reason why I just wanted him to come out here to the front so you see him is because without Albert Busek, I would not have had the bodybuilding career. Stay right there, Albert, and look at this way so they can see your face. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Albert Busek was the one, for instance, just to give you an example. Out of, out of the thousands and thousands of people that helped me, Albert Busick was one of them that helped me to translate into English so I could fill out my entry form for the Mr. Universe contest. And then he flew with me to London to the Mr. Universe contest. He gave me the opportunity to come to Munich and to be the trainer in the gymnasium on the Schillerstraße 36. 
It was a, <laughs> a, a, a fantastic gymnasium. He was an extraordinary friend that took thousands and thousands of pictures since then and helped me in every one of the competitions and everything, was a huge supporter. But this is the kind of people that you need. We need help. We need help. I remember that everything I did always needed help. Think about it when someone says, Arnold, you're the greatest self-made man. I said, you can call me anything you want. You can call me Arnie, you can call me Schwarzy, you can call me Terminator, you can call me Governator, but don't ever call me self-made man. I said, because I did not get to that point by myself. I mean, think about just to be successful in the movies. How are you, you going to be successful in the movies without having an audience? The only one that makes you successful in the movie is, is the people that go to see the movie. So how can you say to yourself, made man, when you need millions and millions and millions of people all over the world to go and see a movie? So people in the press looks at it and says, this guy has a big box of his success. It's the people. It's you. Imagine if Jürgen and I both think that we are self-made people and this hall right now is empty. No one here. Do you think this will be a successful conference? No. Who makes it successful is not him and me. We are just one little molecule that is added to the equation. But you are the ones that make this conference a successful conference. So thank you all of you for being here today. You are the ones that is making it big. Und ich glaube, das ist ein würdiges Schlusswort. Vielen Dank an euch alle und natürlich nochmal vielen Dank an unseren Stargast Arnold Schwarzenegger.